Welcome back to finals weekend here in the LEC summer season. Rogue picked up their very first win against G2 and it was very, very dominant. Barring a few mechanical mistakes here and there, it was the Rogue show all game long. So now we turn our attention to G2. How do they bounce back? How do they adapt? How do they change? Because that is not the G2 that we're used to seeing. Yes, for a start, let's talk about flashes. Can we, you know, use <laughs> agree them? to use them? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Let's let's start there and kind of work our way up. Uh, definitely a very underwhelming point. So G2. However, I've cast G2 long enough to know that game one is not always indicative of the G2 that shows up on the day. So let's see what they bring in game two before passing harsh judgment on them, because it was definitely a strong performance from Rogue. So we definitely know the benchmark that is required for G2 if they want to be able to challenge Rogue in this best of five. And if we're going to just focus this, focus in on the draft, I think the AD carry pick of Callisto was actually pretty contentious. I think we heard the analyst test talking a lot about that, how when the Ashes open, that is the very, very obvious answer into it. So now with G2 remaining on the red side, that's the first thing I'm going to be looking at, that, at for them to sort of mix things up. Well, so far, the bands are exactly the same. Uh, LeBanc, Set, Caitlyn on the side of G2. From game one, it was LeBanc, Set, and Zoe. And Caitlyn, Lucian, and Thresh so far. We are four for four. And it was a first pick Hecarim that ended up stealing the game, uh, at least setting up Rogue to then knock over the Nexus. And we'll see whether or not they're gonna opt to go for the exact same plan, and they do. So no surprises, it worked in game one. Why change it now? Yeah, I mean, this is G2 coming in. They obviously planned on leaving the Hecarim open. I, I feel like the, the Graves is still a good pick into the Hecarim. I am a fan of that, but they're gonna go with the Fall Bear, which has been super popular over in the LCK and the LPL, even after the nerf. Wait, but isn't that top lane that they normally but run? They it? run it in top. They run it in top lane and jungle, so it's seen as a really strong top lane champion on its own, and that's where you can flex it into the top lane if you know jungle. You see a matchup that you don't really like here, uh, but I feel like with Yanko, like Yankos is probably the guy that's going to run this. It is a conundrum, and when we came into the series, we did say we have more questions than expectations. One of the things we've not seen just yet is that Evelyn, and I uh, want to see where the, whether this Volibear does land in the jungle, and there's the Akali once again, this time Lucite and Blind for Rogue. So in game one, Rogue had the ability to bring out the Akali later because I think G2 didn't necessarily expect it from Rogue. But okay. now that it is on G2's radar, Rogue is like, okay, we have to increase the priority on the Akali just a little bit. We know it's strong. Everyone in Europe seems to agree that it's a very strong champion right now. So they want to take that one away. And G2 are going to do what they did against Fnatic last week and respond with the uh, the Tarek to answer some of this dive power, which worked very well last week. We'll see if it works well again. Today. Tarek was also banned in game one during phase two from Rogue's perspective. And along with that Nautilus, which now finds himself in the band pool, what does Caps run into the Akali? What would he like to run? And something that you see is still open and available. It's the likes of that Syndra. It is something we've seen a whole lot. Yeah, I'm almost expecting the, the Syndra to get banned out here as well. Uh, Orianna, even though Rogue picked Akali into the Orianna, pre-6, you can see Orianna nullifies that matchup, even wins that matchup with a ranged trash he's able to put out. So I think Syndra falls into a very similar ballpark and is also one of Caps' strongest champions in the mid lane. So I would like to see that removed. And once that's gone, like, it's the Cap show, you know? Whatever he wants to run to, to try and sell on this Akali because, frankly, like, the scaling mage picks do not seem to beat it. it certainly seems that way right now we're going to see what this final ban is what will rogue choose to take off the board when we're thinking about potential mid lane counters jace is one that you always have to think about it's a bit of an old school counter but because g2 can bring that ap top laner in the form of a nico i think it's something you should always think about we'll see what they do decide to lock in it is going to be the azir I'm not a massive fan, like I get it, Azir can be very powerful, but Akali is also considered one of the go-to counters in Europe to Azir. So clearly just showcasing that respect, they don't want to have to deal with a scaling mage, they don't want G2 be, to be running this front-to-back composition, which they could definitely go for with the draft that they currently have. Ooh, I would love a Lissandra into the Akali, but they're not going to go for it. I'd love to see now where this Volibear is going to end up. We can see it's technically still flex, but we do anticipate it into the jungle. And Perks will lock in the Syndra four caps. His performance all time, 17 wins, four losses on that champion. It is exceptional. It's something that's been so good for G2 consistently. Caps' performance has been very pivotal towards their success. Now for Rogue, I wonder, like, we just Braum Ornit one more time. Orn, 
that through damage into the back lane is so effective next to an Akali. And I was actually talking with Vettius backstage, like Orn, GP, all these champions that can deal damage to a back lane and offer CC, set up so nicely for an Akali pick for any sort of assassin. A GP plus the Hecamult plus the Akali coming to the backside is going to be really, really hard for perks and caps this game. Do you know what's also really difficult for many champions? So closing the gap. When Gangplank Ultimate comes down, Volibear is going to be awkwardly slowed. Ash and Syndra are going to be forced to move. Right now, there are very few engage tools, and I want to see G2 lock in something that can go in, go hard, and actually start a fight. And I think a Scion, considering how good it is into GP, would actually answer all of those as a means to deal with Rogue's comp. Ding, 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 locked in. So one of the big gaping holes from G2's composition is finalized on the last pick with that Scion. Volibear in the jungle, do we like it? Do we dislike it? It came very early in the draft and jungle picks, and in particular, Yankos' performance is something that we're gonna have a close eye on. Look, I think against a lot of melee champions, the Volibear pick can have a, a lot of value. He likes to brawl, he likes to get aggressive, especially with a Syndra next to him. You're playing for control around the middle lane that can be unlocked pre-6, whereas Rogue have to wait until the level six mark before they take over. Ultimately, quick shot, this game is going to be about mid-jungle duos. Last game, Larson and Inspired really set themselves up but it is Caps and Yankos that have traditionally been the strongest mid-jungle duo in Europe. So, can this duo prove themselves? Because they certainly did in game one. It's a new wave of players that Europe continues to just somehow find and produce. Poland just puts out the best junglers, that's a fact. And the mid lane talent pool continues. But Larson playing Akali into Caps' Syndra. Let's hope Caps is a little bit more on fire in game two, as Rogue are taking on G2 Esports. So welcome to Summer's Rift for game number two. Uh, we're hoping for G2 to look a little bit more alert. Uh, definitely got bullied and beaten up in game one, and I do not want to take anything away from Rogue. They earned that victory. They forced fights, they even had a few missteps here and there, but they earned it. Um, and now we want to see if they can continue to push down G2 and what level G2 will be showing today. Looking at some of the summoner spells, seeing if there's anything crazy. We've got the Predator coming out from the Volibear. It used to be Phase Rush, right? Or am I missing? Oh, uh, we actually press saw the a lot of Conqueror press the attack. Yeah, were the, yeah, yeah, were yeah. the two very popular options for Volibear in the early game. I think a lot of pr uh, players, what they realized with Volibear is that, yeah, press the attack is really good for your early skirmishing, but Volibear wins every early skirmish anyway. So with the Predator now, has more opportunities to find ganks and wreak havoc in the early game. And I think that, you know, we already talked about these mid-jungle duo before. I think that we're going to be keeping our eyes very closely on the junglers. Inspired versus Yanko is a matchup that I think many anticipated. The battle of the Polish junglers as Inspired has been looking to prove himself among some of the best here in Europe. And I think that he's done a fantastic job so far this split, especially with Yanko seeming to struggle with the carry jungle meta. And now locking in the volley bear, he's not really making a strong advocate to this carry jungle meta style. Yeah, I mean, Yanko is trying to defy the meta in many ways. And and play through the early game. So he would need to see some of a return to form. Because I feel like this split for Yankos, it has not been his greatest work. You know, back-to-back -back MVPs out of the jungle position, Yankos has not had that same level of impact as Yankos of 2019 perhaps had. So trying to fully commit towards let's make plays happen early, he needs to find that form again. Otherwise, the misplays come in, he gets outscaled, all of a sudden Inspired has a Trinity Force and 20 kills, and you're going to be in trouble again. Yeah, meanwhile, Inspired has embraced the meta. His Evelyn, his Hecarim, his Graves, have all been fantastic, and he's definitely been stepping it up. So we'll see how both go toe to toe in this game. It looks like that they're starting on bot side, moving up towards the top side of the map, with Yankos doing a full clear on the bot side and perhaps looking for another Yankee mid, or maybe looking to try to put this gangplank down early. A lot of options available to him. It was Rogue that were able to strike first in the previous game. Let's see how G2 handle themselves right now. We saw Caps pushing very heavily there into Larson. Anticipated early on. Powder Keg connects here from Finn onto Wanda. We'll get some damage back, but the minion wave starts pushing forward. Lots of trading back and forth. Finn continues to stick around. Wanda, Yankos is making Yeah, keep up. your eyes on Yankos here. Wonder took a lot of aggressive trades early on. Finn relatively low on mana and inspired not pathing towards the top side of the map. Level 3 comes through for Finn, but G2 want to make the play. All right, let's take a look here as Yankos is going to make his way forward. Gets the damage down, applies a red buff as well, and I don't think Wonder was anywhere nearby 
Decimating Smash may have been all that was needed, but Wanda couldn't get past the minion wave. It's the difference between level two and level three right there. As soon as Finn hits level three, he's gonna have access to the oranges, and that's gonna mean that Wonder just calls off play, says, yeah, chunk them out, but I'm gonna make sure I don't miss any CS. And let's have a look at what's happening on the minimap right now. Wrong one, I wanna bring up this one. Notice that Inspired immediately went back to base, and now his plan is to pass straight through the bot side and actually go towards the bot scuttle. His bot lane actually has Pryo in the two versus two, but his mid lane doesn't. So if he had attempted to contest the scuttle crab in the top side river, he would have been in a serious disadvantage because Caps had the push in mid, uh, Sion had the push in top because the GP was also forced to recall, which means that this is good adaptation and still being able to get that early scuttle. And it may even be possible uh, for Inspired because Larson just took the early reset, teleported back in the lane. Like Inspired could play for the respawn of Yankos' Krug camp, uh, or sorry, his Gromp camp rather, with pressure put down towards mid, especially with bot lane also pushing. Here he is. Coming in here from Larson onto Caps. Side steps away, devastating charge comes up. The Rampage backwards, beautifully done from Inspired. Oh, beautiful, just the mechanics right there. Getting the movement speed to dodge away from the scout of the week. Waits to get all the way behind Caps and they shut him down again. This game will be about the mid jungle duo, I believe is what you said, Vedius. And straight out the gates in game two, Inspired manages to make it count. And this wasn't supposed to happen. We said, what, what is Syndra plus Volibear for? It's about playing around mid lane before the level six marks. Well, Inspire says, forget that. He comes there very, very early. And now a flashless cap is only going to be more vulnerable once the, the ultimates come through for those two players. Certainly is. Larson looking at that level six. And remember last game, Rogue played very well around the level six Akali. And I think they're going to be looking to do the same once again. Without a flash, Caps is in a lot of trouble. But more importantly, there was a huge wave stacking up in that mid lane. And there was a real risk that Caps could have frozen that wave and could have made life difficult for Larson. And so thanks to Inspired's intervention, wow. this also makes the 1v1 a lot easier for Larson, as you can already see, him taking a good couple of trades. Yeah, I really like trading there aggressively with the smoke screen. You can also see Caps' wave is building up, so without a flash. Now Larson, in theory, could try to hold the wave, although I think without having the uh, the smoke screen up, he's gonna have to wait the, the minions to walk them their way into the tower, uh, rather. Well, Larson's gonna be very happy with the start of this game. Gets the first blood secured. Reminded that this was a blind pick Akali, and G2 elected to run that Syndra into it. It's still very close on gold. It's only a 200 difference. Wanda's got himself a minor advantage up in that top lane. And now we see Yankos making his way into Rogue's jungle. We'll take that blast cone over the wall and hunt summon Vanda. A little bit of threat here. We'll be getting caught out by the Dazzle. Vanda flashes away. Can still jump to hunt summon a moment or two. And there will be the summoner spell secured as Inspired will get himself another gank up in the top lane. No ultimate available. Wonder will be able to just pop that shield and get away safely. He holds on to his flash as well. So both junglers just making cross map. Yankos could look to secure himself the Drake right now, but his bot lane wants to reset. Yet she has his eyes set on the mid lane. Note that Larson is level six. Here comes the stun. A lot of damage coming out and unleash power as well. Not going to be enough just yet. Larson now decides to turn back around to Yankos. Help coming from Inspired. Larson manages to even push back into the lane. Inspired still lingering if he can find another target. So while that wasn't a successful gank, Yankos is still going to be happy. Flash gets burnt from Larson, ultimate's also gone. Will lose the top side Scuttle Crab, so another advantage game for Inspired. And they might actually look for a re-engage yeah. as Inspired just hit level six. Yeah, Inspired has level six. He also has the movement speed of having that Scuttle Crab Shrine right there. So Inspired on the flank. Will they go for Yankos? Oh, Tower Dive coming in here. Uh, not even gonna get a shot off. Yankos will just get chunked down, but not enough just yet. Larson manages to go in. The Shroud is now timed out in the Dark Sphere. Put so much damage onto Caps. Rampages from Inspired, not gonna be enough. Trade of one for one. A lot of really cool mechanics there. Initially, before the gank happens, Caps actually lands the EQ combo to get the delayed stun through and to stop Larson from actually following up from Inspired, but that's not enough. They commit onto Yankos. This early game jungler falling behind in his hands has Inspired hits that level six first, and they end up trading one for one. I just love watching Larson, or Larson here play with absolutely zero fear going underneath the tower. The smite comes through from Inspired, and it's obviously very big, but, and they still commit to this play, even with, you know, Cyan having the potential to go for the collapse here. Inspired's burst damage is massive. There's the little cool stun interaction you can see from the Syndra to buy time, but then the ultimate comes through from the Hecarim, and they're able to lock him down. And watch Larson here. So he's gonna get the kill on Yankos, but first he's gonna E back, so the mark lands on his, his shroud. He can then get the kill, jump back to it very quickly, and it almost helps him survive and get out of that one. I actually missed it when we were alive, but Vanda also made his way up to that middle lane just as the fight was ending. Had it been a few seconds earlier, may have been able to jump into the fray. Two kills secured here for Larson. 
and he was the focus of our storytelling in game number one. Now we're looking at junglers, inspired again. Multiple ganks, he's showing absolute mastery of this Hecarim. And it's going to be up to Jankos to find some ways to make this volleyball work. He has got access to his level six, though. But it, it feels like we're almost past that point, yep. in, in a way. like. Volibear's efficiency, his, his effectiveness comes from early power power plays, you know, playing for Scuttle Crabs, denying uh, this Hecarim, but now Hecarim is out leveling him, is out CSing him, uh, has to assist to his name as well, so everything is going well for him, and Inspired is going to be funneling himself into this Trinity Force so, so quickly, and once he gets to that point, we are past the point of no return for this matchup. We're waiting to see whether or not Yankos made a play mid, and I mean, it's 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 almost disappointing to see G2 at the moment. Um, all of the fans, all the viewers, all the expectation, team that has got such a long and successful history, currently is being smashed. But at the same time, it's the new young players in Rogue that are stepping up and proving some of the critics wrong. Let's see how this rest of the game plays out, though, as Perks and Mickey will continue to put some pressure on it. To be fair, there's only a 300 gold advantage. But it's more about the way in which Rogue are playing. And it's still looking to G2 to adapt from what we saw in game one. Now, the first Drake hasn't actually gone down yet. A little bit surprising. Often you'll see that priority, especially with the Volibear. We talked about how there was an opportunity, but instead he went for the mid lane gang. Rogue now going to continue, knowing that they don't have a huge amount of control over the bot side of the map. Going to look to secure this Rift Herald for themselves. But notice that some vision will come out from G2. They will be able to spot this one out. Wonder has priority in the top lane, but it's too low. There's not enough time inspired to kind of lock that one down. And I wonder if G2 do move very quickly into the Drake, you know, uh, Hansama just took a reset to finish off the Mirror Mana, but looks like Mickey is just going to go for the reset. So again, typically G2 would always be trading objective for objective. Rift Herald for the Dragon, Top Tower for Bot Tower, these types of plays. Instead, they say they want to set up this freeze down towards the bottom side of the map, knowing that Inspired is top side. The call is, let's try to deny Hansama some CS. Perks already has a small advantage. Can we make that more? But with four ranged minions in the backside there, this will end up pushing into Rogue regardless. Yeah, they're actually setting up a slow push here, which means that G2 could be looking for a dive. Ooh, and Caps Cap's actually just reset. Have teleport. Yep, Same for reset. Wonder. He will pick himself up the Blasting Wand, which means that he can come back into mid lane, clear that one out. But Larson has TP, Finn has TP, Finn has ultimate as well. And that's the biggest thing that could dissuade you 2 from looking for a potential dive. There was a deep ward in this lane too. If the Observers could pan down, I think it just timed out for G2. It was in that brush, so will not have the flank option, but can still teleport to the minion wave on this play. Bankos is making his way forward. Enchanted Crystal Arrow is up. The tension is building. That will tag out Hansama, who still has planes available to him. The Unbreakable comes up from Vand, and that blocks literally everything. Uh, G2, go fishing, but don't find anything. And the problem is, while we're talking about G2's teleports just coming up, well, Larson has his, Finn has his, Finn has the ultimate on top of it. And if Inspired's down there, they're not going to be able to make that play. But Mickey, his team just recalled. He absolutely did. Now he's caught out. We'll be able to get the Economy Gradients down there by some time, as now Yankos is going to be under some pressure. Onslaught of Shadows with a Rampage gets Inspired. Another kill for Rogue. They continue to put pressure down onto Yankos. The TP completes. Caps and Wonder arrive, but it's all Rogue all day. Inspired goes down. Lost is going underneath the tower, looking for the kill. The Shuriken misses its target. Hunt Summer flashes forward, gets stunned under the tower. It's going so wrong for Rogue. They had everything in their sights, and they couldn't find the final hits. And once again, Larson Zakali fumbles the execution. He should have had two clean kills there, and he doesn't get either one. Ends up being a one-for-one -one overall trade, and G2, they'll take that, considering how poorly they ended up giving Mickey's life away for free. Yeah, I mean, I thought G2 were crazy committing the double teleports into that play after Mickey had already fallen, but sidestep, missed skill shots from Larson underneath the tower will help them get away with that one. We'll see exactly how this one went down because again, you see the recall uh, of Perks here. He goes, he commits to it. He, he gets out of this one, but you have the GP ult in to finish off Mickey. And this ultimate, all it does is funnel inspired an early kill. Yeah, it certainly does. So they get that initial kill onto Mickey, and here's where the TPs come through. The follow up TP comes in from the Akali. GP not in getting involved in the fight just yet. This means that the initial fight is actually a three versus four, but they're able to burst out inspired who's already low. And you can see here, Larson, he can't quite decide who he wants to kill. He wants to use the E to hit caps. Get that execute and then also close the gap against Yankos, but because he misses that E, he's not able to do either one of those things, and both those kills walk away with just a tiny bit of health left. It's also, it's a really hard skill shot to forgive for missing there too, because Caps was locked on the tower. He could only really go one way. There wasn't a lot of area for him to juke away from. Larson very much should have had that in fumbles. 
I love the fact that he was going for both, though. Unfortunately, missed it, but it looks... I mean, we've all been there, Quick Shot. You know, I when you not, have so many <laughs> juicy options in front of you and you just can't decide which one to go for. The best thing is, though, it's exactly the same as Game 1 in terms of, like, gameplay approach here for Rogue. They are going for every single fight. They are trying to force errors on G2, and they are trying to earn that advantage by multiple dives and plays. So the biggest difference between Game 1 and Game 2 is that Perks is on a champion that's going to offer a lot more and is going to be easier to play later into the game, especially when paired with this tag. You'll notice that he is a little bit ahead of Han Sama in the farm. He has the fully upgraded Blade of the Ruin King this game as well. Debatable if he should have gone the Essence Reaver, usually against slightly squishier targets. It's better to just get that flat damage. Either way, he's going to have that extra bit of movement speed that you get from the active, and so he is kind of that late game insurance that you're looking at for G2. I want to see if they can get him into a powerful position as the Rift Herald there gets pushed into the mid lane, gets a couple of plates for Larson, but Cap still holds onto his tower. 14 minutes in, still no towers fallen. A lot of tower dives. And one thing that I uh, hadn't actually noticed until just a moment ago, Wonder's already got himself a 25 CS advantage over Finn in the top lane. Uh, make that 30 now, as he's also got the Sunfire Cape completed and sitting very comfortably in that matchup. It seems that G2's strategy when it comes to picking red side has very much been, let's get the top lane counter pick. Uh, they did it in game one with the Kale. We saw Wanda have a pretty big advantage there. We're seeing it again in game two where Finn has had champions that give him slightly um, better matchups early levels, but as the levels progress, it starts to shift in Wanda's favor, and you can see what Wanda is doing there. The thing is, while on the Gangplank, he's gonna still have that ultimate, he's still gonna offer value, uh, and he's always gonna be a threat that you have to be careful of. His Trinity Force obviously very delayed, but now GG looking for a pick onto Inspired. He's cautious, though. Ooh, the Observer's highlighting the vision. There's the Blast Code on the wall. Away. Onslaught of the Shadows is gonna get him over the wall very cleanly, and now Larson and Vanda step forward. Winter's Bite will tag onto Wanda, and it does look like Finn will get away. Now, I know how Inspire is going to scale in this game. We've talked about it a lot. But, Ender, you've been a, a little nervous or hard on Jankos' Volley Bear. How is he going to play in this comp as the game continues to progress? Well, the big difference for him compared to his Graves earlier is even if he is behind, he has a, a higher baseline amount of utility he, he can offer with some of the CC and just being a tank able to absorb a lot of damage here. And I think that's sort of G2's composition in a, in a nutshell with a Scion, a Volley Bear, the Tarak Ultimate. It's about having a huge frontline that can survive and buy space for perks and caps, which was completely absent in the last game. So G2, it's going to be so much more reliant on teamwork, making sure the tanks are working well with the carries and going for engages that can be followed up upon and they're not getting left out to drive. Now, a pretty cool thing just happened on screen, which uh, we often talk about here in the LAC, Senna's pushing power. What you'll notice on the minimap is that G2 actually swapped a number of members up towards top side, and because this tower was already very low, they were able to push that wave, and you can see that both the Ash and Tarak have already reset in the base. Meanwhile, Senna and Braum have only now just gotten back, which means that G2 have a lot more time to come back out onto the map and start making plays. This is typically when you would refer to G2 having tempo. They are now using this to secure themselves a Rift Herald, and off the back of this, they can look for a mid tower, they can look for a bot tower play if they want, but the moment they take this objective, that momentum is going to swing in Rogue's favor, because they're now getting onto the map, and they're going to look to try and challenge. And without the momentum, G2 wouldn't have been able to do Herald, because like they're on vision, right? But Rogue realized, because G2 were back on the map so much sooner, that they do have to give up that play. Now G2 looping around on Finn, they want to shut him down. He is in some trouble. Flash is still available to him. He throws that one down. Stormbringer comes out from Yankos, and the Oranges will not make it okay for ah. Finn. A lot of tower damage coming out, and not going to be able to pick up the kill there with the Dawning Shadow from Han Sama, so they get a clean kill and get out. Yeah, very nicely done. Use the shield there to soak up some extra damage towards the end. And now, G2 can take a reset. You know, Yankees is going to go back to base, and there's an Infernal in 40 seconds. And I wonder, G2, uh, Perks and Mickey can push out this wave and then look to rotate over too, which I think is going to be the play for them. Force Rogue to fight them, because G2 are very powerful at this moment in time. Now, if I'm G2, what I would look to do is clear out bot. I'm going to use a minimap for this. Clear out bot, push this wave out. Right? You then use the Rift Herald to also push in mid. And the thing about the Rift Herald is it creates a massive point of pressure that Rogue will have to deal with. So they're then divided between either contesting for the Drake or the Tower. So even though Rogue is first on the advantage, because G2 have that Rift Herald, it couldn't put them into an awkward situation. You'll already notice, if I bring up the minimap once again, all of G2 now grouping up into the mid lane, doing very go. similarly to what we were talking about. Yeah, and Finn going to be a little late here to get here. Larson as well. And what this means is Caps goes for the Flash, does not connect. Now inspired. Oh, here comes the onslaught. 
those shadows. That's a lot of damage onto Caps, but they won't find the kill just yet. That's a fantastic Terra Ultimate, keeping G2 alive. The Rift Hill takes a tower out as well, and now Rogue are left a man down and a tower down. Larson tries to get some damage onto Yankos, cannot connect the skill shots, and G2 get the tower. Larson, Larson is looking for the re-engage. He's trying to jump onto Perks. Fantastic stun from Caps. Retreat from Larson, and there's simply not enough follow-up. That's a flash forward from Wonder. He will not find anyone with that decimating smash and G2 win the fight, get the tower, and fall back to Dragon. Inspired and Larson going so hard to force that play, but G2 catch it and immediately shut them down. You know, the ultimate did get down from Mickey, which allowed Caps to stay alive, and that was so crucial, because once that comes through, all of Rogue have to back out, and Inspired spent everything getting into the fight. He was a sitting duck. Yeah, initially, I think a lot of question mark pings were coming out as Caps flashed in, trying to get that execute, and when we get the replay, we can see the fumble and execution. I feel like that's kind of in the story of the both mid laners yeah. so far in this series, but look, Look here, wah, wah. Yeah, he doesn't quite land the stun. This then gives an opportunity for Inspired, but Exhaust immediately comes through. Stun followed up from the Tarek, combined into the Tarek ultimate. Mickey really is the MVP on this champion right here to turn this play in Chichu's favor. Then Wonder joins the fight. Yeah, and I mean, Wonder is able to come on in here. The ultimate doesn't quite connect. And then Larson tries to get Super Ivy again. He wasn't there at the start of the fight. You need multiple divers if you are rogue. He tries to make this play happen, but gets CC'd both by Mickey and then Caps the follow-up is brutal here, so he instantly has to piece out. Then Wonder ends up trading the flash there too. And you can see that this was the approach that G2 took against Fnatic's dive comp last week. When Fnatic tried to hard engage onto G2, it was the Tarek with the exhaust, the ultimate, the stuns, the repeated heals that would come out from everyone being in melee range that made it so difficult for Fnatic to successfully dive, and we're seeing here again from Rogue. Now, the crucial thing to note is Rogue was not coordinated yes. in this dive this time around. The Hecarim went in first, Akali went in second, and both of them were solo when they actually went for those plays. Let's see how things pan out when they're more coordinated in the upcoming fight that's sure to come. And it's about the setup time for Rogue. Because in game one, we saw how ruthless they could be when Akali had the time to find that pocket of vision that she could play inside without G2 knowing that she was there to be able to find that collapse. So when Rogue are sprinting back onto the map, let's not look for the play immediately. Let's slow things down, you know, and not try to jump into G2. Because again, G2 was such a tanky frontline, the survivability too. You make one mistake with Rogue's composition and you are not coming back. Of course, while um, Venus was explaining the pushing power and the setup with Tempo, we can see how strong the G2 vision was in the mid lane. Right now, this is the coordinated assault from Inspired and the rest of Rogue. They'll get the Cosmic Radiance out. Uh oh. Now they're continued engaged. The Unstoppable Ooh. Onslaught coming oh, down. Wonder will pull that one short. Teleport was committed from Larson for the play and they will get the flash from Mickey. I think there are sparks flying off that wall from, <laughs> from Wonder's <laughs> ultimate coming down through the Pot River. They don't end up committing in the end. Uh, because I, So I want to talk a little bit more about Rogue's comp because I do find it super interesting how they're meant to dive the back line. Like, they're trying to find that punch before Tarek's ultimate does come through, and we saw that very clearly there. The through damage to set up their backline divers of the GP ultimate and the Sen ultimate. That's not one we, we touched on a little bit earlier. It's that combined damage to get the targets to about, you know, 65%, 70% HP, from which point then a Hecarim or a Kali can finish off a Caps or a Perks in one combo that needs to come through. Otherwise, again, G2 can turn the fight back in their face. It's almost like a modern day Wombo combo, Ender. You know, in the in the traditional, <laughs> back back in Trevor's day, it was the Malphi, Oriana, Jarvan Wombo combo. But now we've got a lot more globals in the game and Senna gangplank with the heck room on top. That's what we're seeing a lot more when it comes to bursting someone. Yeah, Wombo combos back in the day were like 800 range abilities. Now they are 20 million range yeah. abilities. <laughs> <laughs> 200 years of range. 200 <laughs> years of range. That is fantastic. Uh, this game is so close. Uh, it's 600 gold separating them, 22 minutes in. G2 do have two dragons, though, and Rogue haven't really been able to contest or, or set up at the right time the previous fight. G2 just got the better of them. And in contrast to game one, where Rogue had the vision control, Rogue was in G2's jungle, now we get to see how they respond to pressure and how they react to what G2 is doing, because G2, once again, pushing Vision in, trying to set up for this next mountain. So what I'm hearing, Quickshot, is you want Ender and I to explain what Rogue's plan is to try and get a little bit more control over this game. So I wasn't trying to be that deliberate. I'm going to yes, bring up the mini-map for you, and Ender and I are going to talk about this, because what G2 have done is deny a lot of Vision. Thank you for showcasing this observers, and they're looking for a pick. So Rogue is trying to wrestle the way back, and they're looking for a fight! Don't get a chance, though, as now Caps has been jumped on. This time around, the exhaust will stop. The Unleashed Power will be able to pick up the kill onto Inspired. Mickey's running for his life. Larson cannot find the target just yet. 
and the Cosmic Radiance is still available. Hun Summer insta claims flash available to him, but he's not going to be able to use it. He gets shut down, and Wanda arrives. That flash from Caps over the wall got him to safety. And G2 may just peel off towards the Baron here. I mean, you got the jungler Wonder stepping into enemy territory. Finn and Larson both here. Oh, Larson failed to hop over the wall. Well, Wonder's going to try and just walk out. Yeah, Finn not going to be able to do too much. Vander now stepping forward. Going to try and challenge inside the pit, but there's no smite available to them. No cannon barrage either. Three players, powder kick, steel. Might be an option. They still have Cosmic Radiance. It's got the ultimate available to him. Vanda takes so much damage from the burst there of G2, and Wonder's just trying to zone them away. Lost and tagged by the volley. Is he going to look to go in? He goes inside the pit, trying to find the damage. He's not going to be able to find it. The Baron is secured by G2. It's picked up by Ankos. The kill there onto Whoa. Vanda as now Finn is running for his life. Gets so much damage in reply. The Larson is blown up where he stands. G2 with a gigantic play into the Baron, and it looks like they're going to find themselves Finn as well. Yeah, there is nowhere for Finn to go. Cap's going to come on in here to finish it off. G2 in a commanding lead off of that play. They dive Finn out, and they're not even going to lose the mountain play off the back of that. Wonder teleports back in the mid lane, and G2 are right back out there ready to move. Whew. So, I was expecting a lot more setup from Rogue. I was not expecting them to just hard commit to the dive, but from their eyes, they saw an opportunity and they went for it and it did not pan out. When we get the replay, let's talk about that coordination ender because it was something we talked about earlier on. And What does this team fight look like when the entire rogue members commit onto a single target? They all funneled into that little brush that's just above Wonder right now and they committed the Gangplank ultimate, Inspired ultimate, and Larson was looking for the flank, but even with all of that, they still could not kill Caps. And because of that, the fight still went in G2's favor. It was so odd. There were so many opportunities to call off the play. And once again, they are squaring up against G2. But the zoning is excellent here. G2 will get their third drake. The game of the arrow oh, comes through. Another fantastic stun coming out. Inspired jumps in alone, but he doesn't have Larson with him because Larson's currently dueling with Wonder. He's going to dash through once again and continues to retreat. Whoa. Whoa. But that is fantastic from Caps and G2 landing every single thing as Rogar melting underneath the tower. G2 are going to keep pushing through Baron Pod minions. I don't know when G2 are going to stop because that was just uh, an obliteration down there in the bottom lane. They have the minions to work with. Rogue will not be able to defend their bottom lane inhibitor. G2 struck and they struck hard. And just like that, Claps is suddenly online. You give him an inch and he'll take a mile. His Syndra coming up clutch once again. The G2 squad definitely looking more in form here in game two. The composition and how it's working together is just fantastic. Mickey's had some game-changing cosmic radiances. The engage from Wonder has thwarted so many of these potential dives from Rogue, but I do want to call out, I think we're seeing a huge mentality from Rogue. They just want to fight the entire time, regardless yeah. of the, uh, the setup. And this fight, I understand a little bit more, because like the Cosmic Radiance is on cooldown. They feel a little bit better about going for this type of maneuver, but it's just so split up, right? Inspired dives into the back line, but Larson is getting 1v1 by a Scion. Again, if Larson is not diving with Hecarim, you can't make it happen. And that's where Caps comes up absolutely clutch, a three-man stun right there. There is no coming back to that. I think one of the biggest differences this time around is something you you mentioned quick shot was that and Endo was talking about it as well. There's no front line from G2's comp in game one, but now with Wonder on Scion, he's just this giant meat shield that just keeps getting in the way and he keeps creating chaos on the back line that whenever Rogue tried to commit to these dives, it's not as easy as it was in game one. So now with the Baron buff just wearing off, G2 might have to look to buy a little bit more time, look to reset, but they have their eyes set on the top tier too. Yeah, and they also in three minutes, it's going to be a Dragon Soul, the, the mountain for them, which I mean, you got two tanks, three tanks, could not get any better than that for them. Rogue are gonna have to try to wave clear, but their wave clear tools aren't even that excellent, right? It's the Senate, it's Nikali, really just gangplank barrels to try and cut through that. And G2, they're strong enough that they can tank tower shots. Just, I'm just waiting for Rogue to engage. I'm just waiting for Inspired and Larson. Look at them waiting in the wings. There's a lot of damage there onto Caps. The opportunity is up. Cosmic Radiance will come down and keep all of G2 alive. They simply cannot follow up. Larson is waiting to go in. Cannon Barrage comes down. Only Wonder is available to them. They're hitting, they're hitting, they're hitting, but it's not gonna matter. The damage to from G2 are still so safe in the back line. Larson cannot get buff tank number two. Yankos, finally, Wonder goes down, but Larson is shut down by G2. The beefy front line for G2 is working. And this whole time, there's still super minions in the base. Rogue have not been called back to deal with them, so G2 re-engage on 
onto the tower. The third inhibitor, or the second inhibitor tower that is going to drop G2 well into the base. Burn. Look at the heals from Mickey. Caps is almost full health again, like he's just hitting onto everyone. And it's just so much utility that's being provided from this Tarek support. We understand why it was banned in game one. And I think you have to take it off of Mickey's hands because he's just too damn good at this champion. No doubt about it. Zero, one, ten out of his team's 12 kills. Taking a look at Caps on that Syndra as well. Five, one, and four, extremely pivotal with those unleashed powers, and more importantly, the scatter of the weak uh, stuns that he's been able to find so consistently. So G2 break all three inhibitors. They've got themselves a Mountain Soul in a minute and a half. They've got double supers, and they start making their way into the base, and it's just up to G2 how they want to try oh, play poor this out. Poor Vander. just trying to get some information. He'll get taken out. Yes, he will. Yep. Yep, Vander, he was trying to be cheeky, interrupting Perks' his back, and he was like, oh. You interrupt my back. <laughs> okay, then let's see how that works. And let's have a look back at this fight once again. So initially, Caps takes a lot of damage, but look at this. The fear actually sidesteps Caps out from the ultimate of Senna. Then the ultimate comes through from Mickey, and Mickey's whole goal here is to just peel Larson away from the fight. Larson still has the shroud, and the rest of Rogue are like, okay, let's kill the front line. Yeah, just such a good position, like based on the terrain for G2 to fight in, because all Mickey has to do is lock off that one choke, and there's no way for Larson to get into the back line. So they kite him all the way out back there and then can look to re-engage. I mean, even when Wonder dies, he's still got that body lingering around. So it's not even like Rogue can walk on past that. Now G2 have everything inside of Rogue's base except for the Nexus. I mean, we started this game saying the mid-jungle duo is going to be so pivotal. Inspired lost and had a great laning phase, but they haven't been able to dive together. Look, again, Inspired goes on to the back line, gets the Fia, but the rest of G2 are destroying Rogue's back line. Hans Summer is dead. The Nexus turret is down. Vanda falls as well, and G2 in under 30 minutes look to kill four members of Rogue with so many super minions in the base. They'll even turn to hunt down Larson before they look to finish out the game. G2, even the series, one to one. We got a series on our hands. The thing that I love about both of the games, there has been a conscientious effort to tower dive, to fight, to force errors from your opponents. And on both sides of the rift, they're willing to play this style. I will say that what we're seeing in the early game is, I think, a much stronger performance from Inspired and Larson when it comes to 2v2 laning and within the first 10 to 15 minutes. However, I think one of the bigger differences we're seeing later on into the game is Wonder. Like, I think in game one, his presence was less felt because of how far behind G2 ended up falling. But in game two, I felt like that he was so pivotal in the front line that he created so much space for his team. But also, some of the coordination from Rogue definitely felt a little off compared to what we That's saw That's what one. was missing so much in this game because they kept trying to force these fights where not all the conditions had been met bleeding up into it. So you, you weren't having, you know, Hecarim plus Akali working together. That wasn't quite meshing. And that's something that is absolutely crucial to Rogue. That has been such a huge strength for them, this split, Let's that needs to come back. If they can keep it up to the rest of the series. The reigning champions have bounced back. We'll see if they get a rematch against Fnatic in tomorrow's final. That's what's at stake. Yes, yes, yes. Whenever we find our mojo in this team, we're a really good team. I feel like if we if we were to lose on Sunday, we wouldn't have redeemed ourselves. Hitting in the wings, dredge line from Mickey's buying so much time. Whippo's going low and he's taken out and down. Now Cap jumping into the back line, looking for Reckless. Gets the kill onto Reckless, but how much more can he do? self is rampaging across Cap's face. And it's actually very possible to be the new kings in Europe.
Our teams are so good this year. I can't believe they actually made it. Woo! What? It's on Champions Eve. Beko Harvest Fresh preserves vitamins for longer by simulating the natural 24-hour sun cycle. Beko, eat like a pro. Have a bite. It's good. You Dancing without you, out you, out you. Dancing without you, out you, out you. Tell strangers about you, about you, about you. You're not here to take me home, so I'll party on my own. I'm dancing without you. This could be the final chance, our last dance. Are you ready? Come on, dance with me, with me, LBC. Come on, dance with me, let yourself be free. Come on, dance with me, with the LEC. Come on, dance with me, do that Pepe D. Time for a show. Show them how you outplay. Go and check the replay. Dubs like all day. Boy, you better know. Know that it might be just a little high fee. Trying to call about these watches. Go. Cause the games are straight fire. Every team fight coming down to the wire. The whole world trying just to look like us. Take a look at your league. Wish you played like us. Now time to check reality. You're facing a tragedy. When the European legacy comes sucking down your pride to be those feelings of anxiety. The future you don't want to see. The wrath of our whole dynasty. It spells LEC. This could be the final chance. Our last dance together This could be the final chance Our last dance Are you ready? Come on, dance with me With the LEC Come on, dance with me Let yourself be free Come on, dance with me With the LEC Come on, dance with me Do that Pepe D Talk that good shit. Boy, you better back it up. <laughs> if you want the up yell, sorry, that's just not enough. Cause we got every team fighting lame flashbox when they clash. You would never last less than a hundred. Bring your A game. If you want to claim fame, that'd be your main aim. Now you're in the right lane. Show up or shut up. No time for excuses. Can't take a series. You're probably just useless. You want a shot at us? You can come get it. If you're just talking, then you can forget it. We're going to blow up. We're on the rise. E Euphoria, this is the vibe. We wear the clown nose and we wear the crown. Kings of the West, you know we hold it down. Life. This could be the final chance. Our last dance. Together. This could be the final chance. Our last dance. Are you ready? Come on, dance with me. With the LEC. Come on, dance with me. Let yourself be free. Come on, dance with me. With the LEC. Come on, dance with me. Do that Pepe D. We've come a long way since the beginning. The dark days of double streams, vacation memes, now charged up and charging forward. We are the LEC. We can't be stopped, slowed, or suppressed. This tenacity is EU at its best. It's time for the LEC Loyals to show their fandom. Put your hands together. This is your anthem. Come on, dance with me. With the LEC. Come on, dance with me. Let yourself be free. Come on, dance with me. With the LEC. Come on, dance with me. Do that perfect.
Welcome back, everyone, to the LEC studios where the reigning champions bounced back and tied the series in game two. Uh, it looked dire for G2 well into that second game, but still they managed to turn it around. Let's start with the picks and bans and the adaptations made. And I think we should look at G2's perspective since they did lose that first game. Back on red side, Yamato, what did they do better in this draft? I, I don't know if it's so much G2 doing better because I feel like them just going for, you know, what they have tested in the past, just going back to Volleyball, which is the closest thing to sets. I don't know if it's, you know, some supreme adaptation. I feel like it's more about Rogue showing their cards completely with the Akali, Hecarim, Senna lock-in. Then you know exactly what that composition wants to do. And I think G2 showed already against Fnatic that the Tarek adaptation is just perfect against that. And I think this is what drove the game home. Yeah, it, it has great anti-dive tools on G2's composition. You talk about the Terrac ultimate, you know, if someone trying to dive into you, the scout of the week. Um, Scion Q being charged up, Volley controls a lot of space. And Volley Bear's position in this, I feel like he, he, like Olaf, is a good champion at kind of splitting fights front to back. And that if someone is diving into you, Volley Bear just has to sprint forward. And as long as he separates the back line from Rogue's front line, then... If Rogue don't instantly kill someone in the engagement, then I expect G2 to win the team fight. So that's kind of how I saw this one playing out. My issue is, is that when you see, like it used to be that when Volley Bear was the big jungle pick before he got nerfed, um, that he just basically won every single matchup or every mm -hmm. single 2v2. And when you see Syndra, you're like, oh, that's a really strong 2v2 mid jungle. But again, Caps had a phenomenal back half of the uh, game they're still losing the 2v2 mid-jungle early on. Larson and uh, Inspired are definitely getting the better of Yankos and Caps in particular. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think it's it's so wild because the purpose of the Volleyball as a champion is not going to be that effective at later stages in the game. I think the comparison with Olaf is just perfect because 1v1, Volleyball is going to win a lot of fights. With the Predator, maybe less so. But in this case, the 2v2s were lost on mid. And if you give an advantage to Hecarim and Akali in different situations where there's not a Tarek and a Sion waiting on the other side, then uh, it can get very dangerous. It can. So let's break up the game then. An asset in the beginning. Uh, early game again. Not good from G2 and very, very good from the side of Rogue, especially the Hecarim Makali um, combo doing work in the early game and putting G2 behind straight from the start. We we thought that this would be Caps favored. And two times, again, Caps had a great game on the Syndra, but the lane phase isn't necessarily where he's really shining. And while Larson did not necessarily misplay, but I think that dive in particular where he could have uh, chosen to kill one person instead of trying to kill both. But what if he executes on that? Then suddenly you're on the back half of this game, you're like, oh my god, Larson's having an incredible game. I think the real difference is these two gentlemen on your screen right now, Inspired versus Yankos. And they have very different responsibilities to their teams because they're playing very different champions. But I feel like Inspired's just getting the better of it. Yeah, for sure. I think always with a champion like Hecarim, you imagine that this is a champion that wants to reach level six and then wants to begin to have impact. But he's always finding that first blood, the beautiful movement where he dodged the Sindri. He completely mechanically outplayed the caps in the mid lane. And with that being uh, said, you know, getting those advantages with Hecarim is something that should put you in a position to win the game, but with the Tarek adaptation, it just became too hard. You keep going back to that Tarek I adaptation. Tarek. <laughs> uh, I just want to, like, kind of button this up in the sense of we do want to see a little bit more from Yonkos, right, going forward. I mean, you, you, even if you win that game SG2, you don't want to get that far behind early, right? Um, but as Yamato said, do you want to add something? There? I just, I agree with you. But or you just, don't mind. It's like, it's so hard because they just have very different things. Yeah. I, I will say that uh, Rogue really showed me that they are not going to lose the 2v2, because that was what we had expected, that if anyone will win 2v2 mid-jungle, it should be G2. Yankos and Caps are so powerful, but Rogue came to play together, and on a champion like Hecarim that you usually don't expect to get that far ahead, Inspired and Larson are making us eat our hordes. Exactly, uh, and they're doing fantastically in that, and as said, uh, Yamato, now you can talk about the Tarek. We're going to get into <laughs> those team fights uh, in the mid lane, especially this one around 17 minutes. Talk to me about kind of Mickey's play and how this all works in the team fights. It's just a the fact that everyone gets to survive with a sliver of health, uh, always against the champions that Rogue have with the, the Hecarim and the Akali. It's all about, you know, in the first wave of ultimates, are you going to uh, shut those targets down? And then you get to sustain with, of course, the Hecarim W, with the Conqueror if you have it, and of course the Akali. But the Tarek shuts everything down. Everything becomes so predictable in Rogue's pattern of play because of how they drafted with the Akali and Hecarim so early on. So G2 just need to be like, okay, we're going to poke, and then the enemy has to go into us because there's no threat of any range capabilities on Wait. Rogue's side. 
What's so funny to me is we kind of set up this entire day that even with Rogue kind of showing the new picks that they did in their previous series, that they really hadn't changed their playstyle that much. And we talked about G2's playstyle being mid jungle into bot lane and trying to snowball. They've completely changed. G2 is actually playing the Rogue playstyle, where it's like group up as five and like a little death ball. They try to dive in, you survive it, and then you win. And Rogue are trying really hard to press advantages, you know, trying to set up dives and making a lot more plays around that mid jungle. And uh, even though it's not the cleanest games, I am still very excited for both these teams to showcase the versatility of them heading into Worlds. I have to agree. I uh, I really like it just also in this best of five that we're seeing good things from both sides. Let's take a look at the other team fight that really sealed the deal for G2 Esports. And with that also, talk about a bit of the individuals on the lineups. Uh, I think Caps shines in these late game team fights and these mid game team fights as well. And I think uh, he really came into his own in the second game. Uh, he has been a standout performer for me. Yeah, I think this is kind of the part in the game where Caps really started to pop off and then it all just got better from here. You know, it's interesting because I disagree a lot with what the teams are fighting over. Like, I don't think that this is the cleanest series that we've seen from both teams, although I, I do like that we're seeing some experimentation. And also, there's some weird mechanical mistakes, and then some of the mechanical outplays, I don't know, maybe we're warming up. It got a little bit better as the series went on. But now, going into game three, I really want Caps to continue with kind of the same um, collapse that we expect for him going into it, because I was like, lane phase, kind of non-existent. Back so end, great. Sorry, we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on the fact that uh, Rogue chose blue site for this third game, oh. Yamato. Oh, okay. Do you think they run back Hecarim priority? I think Hecarim is going to continue it, but just change the mid lane prior because the Akali is just, you can't look in Akali Hecarim so early. And I'm hoping that G2 dropped the trash ban because I don't get it. Why is trash getting banned? The champion is not good. Who knows? Um, yeah, G2, they are looking to get a rematch against Fnatic tomorrow, but first they're going to need to get through Rogue. Find out who takes the lead after this. Maybe not.